So today's topic is on discontinuation of prolia. And so I really wanna thank Dr. Janet Rubin for tackling this very important topic. There are many individuals in their 50s and 60s and even 70s who have been on prolia for eight to 10 years. And their understanding is that it's not recommended to stay on prolia for much more than a decade due to concern of atypical fractures and osteonecrosis of the jaw. Others are told by their oral surgeon to discontinue prolia in preparation for dental surgery. Some people are concerned about what they should do regarding upcoming joint replacement surgery. Finally, others develop side effects and need to stop. I have clients telling me that they're not getting clear direction on this topic um, in regards to a safe way to deal with the situation. And so I've reached out to Dr. Janet Rubin to help us understand and navigate this complex situation. Thank you for sharing your extensive knowledge as both a distinguished professor of endocrinology, a practicing endocrinologist, as well as a prominent researcher in bone biology. So we're so very grateful to have you. And so before we begin, are there any conflicts of interest or disclosures? Uh, none at all. And I'm um, happy to be back with you again. Thank you, Janet. Um, so can we begin with a quick review on how prolia works on a cellular level to build bone mineral density and help reduce fracture risk? Yeah, so prolia is a, a big um, drug in our arsenal for treating osteoporosis. It's an anti-resorptive drug. It works by binding to and inhibiting rank ligand, which is the critical necessary molecule for recruiting and developing these osteoclast cells that resorb bone. So prolia stops these cells from being recruited. It stops them from acting on bone. And what happens over the long run is instead of having a cycle where a uh, bone is taken away, um, it, that is kind of stopped. And so the process of making new bone can continue. Of course, when you're a postmenopausal lady, you're gonna be making new bone slower than you did when you were 10 or 15 or two. So the process is slow, but you are always gonna be making new bone. So prolia stops one side, the breaking down of bone and your own physiology allows you to make some new bone. So a lot of my readers and list followers, they understand the terms osteoclast and osteoblast. So if I make it a little bit more scientific, which you're kindly not doing, um, is the prolia has inhibited the osteoclast and it's uh, still allowing the osteoblast to build. Correct, correct. Very so scientific. Then... <laughs> Thanks, Janet. Um, so the million dollar question I get is, what happens on a cellular level when you stop using prolia? You know, yeah. So, so that has been a question in you know, evolving over the past. I guess prolia has probably been around since two thousand and five. Um, so prolia or denosumab has a half-life of about a month. So your patients are, our patients are getting it every six months. It has a biological half-life that lasts around six months. And that's why you get the next, uh, the next dose at six months. So when you stop this monoclonal antibody, right, that's binding to the rank ligand, when you stop it, um, it is not in your body anymore. So your bone resorption or your osteoclasts start to work again. And we've known for a long time that as you gain bone and if you stop the prolia, as soon as you stop it, you're going to start to lose bone again, and maybe even a little faster than you would have lost it if you had never been on the drug. So it has to be used very thoughtfully. 
So what happens when you stop? Well, the osteoclasts start again. And the old dogma since I was a young medical student, which was a long time ago, um, was that osteoclasts have a half-life of about a week. So they were, they're were they kind of automatons, they do their thing, and then they go away, they apoptose or, or you know, just disappear. There was a study last year um, by, some, by Michelle McDonald, who is the lead author uh, in Australia, and it's a, an amazing study that really has changed the way that we have to think about osteoclasts. And that is that these multicellular cells, the multi, there's a bunch of nuclei in them, where they have to have a bunch of nuclei to kind of tent over the bone and resorb it. So when, what prolia, what denosumab or prolia does is stop this cell from, from doing this. And we all thought it went away. What seems to happen is that that cell kind of breaks up into little pieces and they kind of go and hide out somewhere. It seems, and there are still studies that need to be done, it seems that when the, the inhibition from the denosumab goes away, that the, the cells that have been hiding out come together and start up again, probably pretty fast. So I think that's probably true. It was a, a paper in a really esteemed journal um, called Cell. I think that paper is true, it was published in 2021. But irregardless, we know from multiple clinical studies now that when uh, denosumab is stopped and not followed with another agent, that our patients will have increased bone resorption. And that is a problem. So you can't just stop prolia. So the all of a sudden you have like technically more osteoclasts than you had even before you were on denisumab acting on your bone and your osteoclasts aren't keeping up. So that's what this, maybe this more recent scientific paper would suggest. I think not all of us are exactly the same and there'll probably be people who have more of this and other people who have less of this. When I think you're the reason we're talking about this is because of this, um, this phenomenon of rebound fractures after stopping denosumab. And there are people who are more, who are going to be more predictive to have that. And there are people who've had fractures before who have very low bone mineral density. You know, the people are at risk for osteoporotic fractures. Not everybody is the same. I mean, there have been people who've come off denosumab and, you know, everyone is going to lose bone mineral density, everyone uh, who's been on that drug. But if they're really high and they're losing it, maybe they aren't going to have as much tendency to fracture as somebody who was more frail, whose bones were more frail to begin with. And is there a reason that you know um, that most of the fractures that get reported are of the spine as opposed to of the hip, at least in the talks I've attended or the papers I've read. Um, and so you get these sometimes fractures. Yeah. yeah. So I th think that the phenomenon does extend to other places than the spine, but there's a lot of vertebrae. So there's a lot more to look at and study, and they're you know they're much more common than a hip fracture, right? There, you know, there's there's just a lot of them, a lot of lumbar, a lot of thoracic. So it's an easier place to get your data out of because you have twelve plus five rather than two hips, one which maybe has already been fractured or two humeruses. Pelvic fracture is impossible to even talk about, even though they're a problem. So, so yeah, it can be anything, but it's the, the thing that's really kind of it, that exploded was the multiple spine fractures after, um, after discontinuation of, of the drug. 
Yeah. So I'm just going to clarify the 12 plus 5, 12 thoracic um, vertebrae and five lumbar vertebrae. And so, yeah, listeners, Margaret knows more about this than anyone. <laughs> so, you know, just those, those vertebrae. I also find with a lot of my female clients, because they like, the, while they're on their feet a lot, you know, with just living and housework and, and running around and they like to walk or they like to dance, um, their hips tend to be a little bit stronger in the bone mineral density. I see that more often and, and a lower score um, going into taking a pharmaceutical will be seen at their spine. So as well, you say, well, there is definitely a reason for that. And I actually don't think it's that they, you know, that they walk more. I think that your younger patients, the spine goes down much faster than they have. So you're really starting to look for osteoporosis in the 60s. And a lot of those ladies will have decreased spine density, but their hip density, because there's much more cortical bone, it takes a longer time to go away. You don't really start see that start to go off you know, until the late sixties in, in a lot of people. So I think it's common where the first drug is given for a low spine density because they're not in their seventies. By the time you get to the seventies, the, the hips tend to have caught up to the spine. Spine tends to get more sclerotic and doesn't fall as fast as the hips. So, hmm. okay. you know, so I think that's, what really you're you're seeing. So the 60 year old lady is at risk for spine fractures, not so much for a hip fracture. And that's pretty much what those young, what I call my young patients, those people are getting put on drugs for spine. Okay. Now we had a, a great conversation about drugs um, in general and one of the comments that had surprised me at the time was that you generally wait till someone's, you know, in their eighties before you um, will initiate polia or denisumab for them. But so, so, for- So that's not quite true. Oh, okay. Um, I use prolia a lot. Um, what I said about the, my older clients mm. is once somebody gets to be in their late eighties, I worry less about the very rare side effects as you started with osteonecrosis and atypical fractures. They have such a high risk of having a hip fracture and Prolia is such a safe drug. We have 10 year data on it and it's a really great drug. So if I have a frail 85 year old, I might put them on Prolia and never holiday them. Whereas if I'm looking at a 65 year old, 70 year old, I want to get them to a holiday. Sometimes, in fact, a lot of times I use Prolia because it is very good at moving the densities towards target. But if I'm gonna use the Prolia in that patient, and, and again, every patient is different. So I'm not giving a prescriptive, but if I'm gonna use Prolia in a younger lady, and I really wanted to get them to a holiday, then I am making plans to transition them to an agent that I can holiday them on. And the only real osteoporosis drug that you can do that with that we feel very good about are the bisphosphonates. So, you know, I see less of this than I used to, but I see I see these ladies say, I am never going to take a bisphosphonate. So put me on Prolia. And I'm sitting there going, you're 65. I'm not putting you on Prolia for the next 30 years of your life. So that is something that, you know, it seems to require continual explanation in the office. And you already know in your, you know, that if they're going to be on it, it's going to then transition, at least with the knowledge we have today, onto a bisphosphonate. So can I ask you what type of bisphosphonate or is that also individualized? I mean, I use them all, but um, because I'm a specialty clinic, uh, because Medicare pays for the once year, yearly Zomeda, I tend to use that a lot because it's 
kind of no fuss, no muss, and I know the patient's gotten it. You know, and a lot of people do have gastrointestinal upset with their once a week drugs. But the, the prolia problem, so there are, there are a physician in the triangle area who basically have run prolia clinics and then they retire and all of a sudden everybody is picking up their prolia patients and wondering, you know, are they getting to us in time? Um, so the, so one of the things that, that I, you know, in kind of the lore of the uh, denosumab rebound fracture, they're kind of two things that are, they're not fun, but they're interesting to think about. One is that denosumab um, in many European uh, places, locales, was paid for um, during treatment of breast cancer. And then when the patient was thought to have gone into remission, the prolia was stopped, right? So that's where I think where we really, where I first started to hear about these, uh, yep. these rebound fractures. The other place where we've experienced it, um, at least in North Carolina in the last several years, is patients who are on prolia, not mine, thank goodness, patients who are on prolia who would not go to the doctor during their COVID isolations. They said, nah, you know, I'm just skip my prolia. That was a problem. And I have seen those patients. You know, there's a big deal in the endocrine literature, in the bone literature. What are we going to do with our patients who are on osteoporosis therapy when they don't want to come to the office? You know, I just told my patients, you got to come. Um, some people, if they're really unwilling or unable, you might have had to send them bisphosphonates, oral bisphosphonates to take until they could get into the office. Because it's a real problem. It's not a fake problem. So on that um, same vein, how long can they safely or comfortably go, oh, I'll wait till, you know, how many weeks or months before? Well, I'm sorry to say it's not very long. So the uh, rebound fractures can start to happen within a couple of months. So uh, no one can live their life totally by clockwork. I'll give a person, I start to feel nervous if it's more than four to six weeks that they haven't made it in for their prolia. Now I can't run their lives, but I tell them in the office, this is something you can't goof around with. You so when I first started giving prolia, you know, um, before 2010, we didn't have it kind of down. And so the nurses would say, okay, call for your appointment in six months. And then they'd come and see me in a year and they hadn't gotten their prolia, right? You know, I'm looking at it. You didn't show up for your six month appointments a year later. So somebody in our clinic um, figured out that the nurse had to give them a, an appointment the day they got it. Yeah. I mean, that has helped hugely. So, yeah. At the 2018 um, ASBR Mark conference in Montreal, I actually spoke to Dr. Rodriguez, who was the lead mm -hmm. author, the, the one of the first papers. And she was saying, if they've only had the first one, she hasn't seen, a, seen rebound fractures if yeah. they've only had one. Yeah. But after the second one, that you know, whether yeah, it's, it's kind of the longer you've been on it. Yeah. yeah. I think that's absolutely true. Um, um, so there's no established protocol other than a bisphosphonate. My general, so the, in generalities, if I want to get somebody off prolia, I'm thrilled with what's happened to them. They have their bone mineral density has gone up and a lot of people are kind of resistant to their bone mineral density increasing further on, on a bisphosphonate, you can move that. You can still move that bone density with uh, prolia. So I like that drug, I really do. But in preparation, I usually have 
the patient and I have looked at their bone mineral density together. We've agreed that we can, we can make the transition and I usually transition to a bisphosphonate. Um, if a patient comes to me and there's some odd reason why they can't be on a bisphosphonate, I really have to think about what I'm going to do. Hmm. You know, if they're 87, I'll leave them on the bisphosphonate. If they can't, you know, they're, I've used estrogen, um, you know, forms of estrogen, like Reloc Avista, um, but it is a tricky question. So it's usually, I, I usually talk to my patients when I want them to be on Prolia and tell them this is my plan. I mean, doctors can't promise that everything is gonna be perfect. We have to plan for what we hope for and want to protect our patients from fractures. And we go from there. I do have another question um, that I think we didn't address is those women who have been on it for eight to 10 years and on, on it being denusumab or prolia, um, and they're feeling that they should not be on it longer. Is that co correct? You know, should, should they, if they're in their 50s, because some are 60s, 70s, and they are healthy and they look like, you know, genetically they might live to be 100, do how long would you recommend that they stay on prolia, assuming they've made gains with it and they're coming up to their first decade of using it? So I, I don't want to get in the way of that patient and their doctor. That would be very something that would be very unusual for me to do. I do not like looking at 57 year olds and 67 year olds who, I mean, I have patients who are in their late nineties. I mean, people are gonna live a long time. I like them to have holidays. I, so, so there are other things come, that we don't quite know how to use like uh, the Romozuzumab or Avenity in the United States that may be an out for some of these people, but that but we still have to, you know, see how that's going to pan out. So yeah, if you're 65 and you've been on Prolia for 10 years, I, I would talk to your, your doctor about a strategy to get out. But there may be a reason, there are some people, say if you have renal failure um, with a high fracture risk, you might have to stay on Prolia. So there are cases and every patient is very different. Um, so it's hard for me sitting here like a talking head to say to a patient, you have to go tell your doctor, you have to do this, but you yeah. can ask them. Yeah, and I recognize the people you see are cases that are far more complex and have many comorbidities. And I see generally people that are very healthy and looking to exercise and have that one major concern. Um, and so that's why I've asked you to, yeah. to help them with that issue. Um, and I think, you know, the more that I see people get older um, and getting older in a healthy fashion, and I don't, you know, as I've told you before, I don't think that for many people that exercise can replace the drugs that we have to give people to decrease their fracture risk. That being said, I think that exercise and being strong probably gives you some kind of equal protection in a, in a funny way that you fall correctly and, and you protect yourself correctly. So I, it's just in many people, it's not enough, but in everyone, it's really something. Yeah. yeah. And we've had this discussion before where we, you know, whether they do a pharmaceutical or not, the, the exercise is only going to, you know, it's enhance. only going to help. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and you've kind of given me the liberty to look at my people who are, you know, who are 
really frail and say, get up, you know, really, please try this for me. You know, do, do a, a wall plank. So, so that's great. So those individuals who, because if they're, they're, you know, in their sixties and everything's healthy, except their hips really hurting them because they have advanced osteoarthritis and they're waiting for a hip replacement, what would be the recommendation if this was your client perfectly healthy other than um, osteoarthritis of the hip or knee and you know their um, physician has retired and now they're your patient and they're in their 60s. I think people have looked into this and the data is that you don't have to come off the prolia for the hip replacement. That being said and you know so none of these drugs seem to really interfere with, you know, with bone healing in the kinds of um, things that our patients are doing. That being said, you know, we may go on in the next 10 years and find out that we really shouldn't be doing it this way. Um, But so far, I don't think there's really any good data that says that I have to take, first of all, I'm not going to take them off Prolia for their hip replacement. Um, I'm just not going to. So, uh, and the data would suggest that they heal just fine. All right. So I know it's impossible to answer everybody's um, concern and or address everybody's concern, but you've certainly shed a lot of light on it, on it for people. And, and again, made us realize how complex bone is and how everybody's case is very individualized and, and that they should really, you know, search out to um, strengthen their relationship with their doctor because really that's the person who's going to, to guide them through the process of, of keeping their bones strong and healthy as they continue to exercise and, and stay fit. So, Absolutely. Yeah. so Janet, I really want to thank you so much again. It's my um, great for pleasure. Your time and, and, you know, your knowledge and for, um, yeah, so really appreciate it.